Hello, everybody. Uh, so a lot of people have been asking for uh, more assembly language programming videos, and I really want to do those, but I've run into a bit of a problem. So there already, uh, there are a bunch of different operating systems. There's Windows, Linux, and Mac. And uh, uh, what I decided to do was create videos um, that were on Linux and used x86 because that's... Um, that would be the easiest way to have a virtual machine environment. You could set up a virtual machine, so it doesn't matter if you're wanting, running Windows, Linux, or Mac. You could set up a virtual machine, install Linux, and then you would be able to follow along and have, um, and have code that works. But what has happened over time is things have gotten a little bit more complicated. So uh, Linux is actually changing over time. So if I had done videos that had um, that worked with, say, Windows, um, like creating Windows and so forth and doing graphics, uh, that would have involved using the X window system. But the X window system is now being replaced by Wayland. And it looks like Wayland is just going to replace X uh, within the next year or so on most distributions. And that would have obsoleted uh, most of the code that I had written. Uh, same thing with sound or anything else. Uh, there's another thing that has happened, and that is uh, there's a proliferation of platforms. So 10 years ago, basically everyone ran an x64 processor. Uh, but today, uh, uh, Apple has switched to ARM processors. Uh, there's people who run Raspberry Pi as their main computer, and that runs an ARM processor. Uh, Windows has released a version for ARM, and uh, there's now RISC-V. So, and Linux has been ported to RISC-V, and, and RISC-V processors are becoming more popular. And so we can imagine, you know, who knows, maybe in the future, maybe Apple will switch to RISC-V, and everybody will switch to RISC-V. Who knows what's going to happen? But that means that the assembly that I write um, just won't work in the future. And I would rather the things that I teach, I want the, I want the concepts that I explore to be general and transferable to basically any assembly language. But I also want to have specific examples that work, that you can download the code and actually run the code. And for that to be possible, you need to have a stable platform, right? A stable processor and a stable operating system. And so I've been thinking about this a lot and how to have that kind of stability and what I came up with is uh, DOSBox, right? So DOSBox is an emulator for an x86 processor that also runs a kind of emulated version of DOS, right? So DOS is the disk operating system and people uh, uh, really, I mean, the original one that ran, ran on most people's computers was MS-DOS, right? There are several different kinds of DOS, but MS-DOS was the most uh, popular version that ran on computers. And so DOSBox allows you to have this environment that's the same for everyone. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and there's an even ver uh, there's even a version of DOSBox for DOS, uh, which is kind of funny. But the three most common operating systems can all run this emulator, right? And it's very simple. It's just a program, and you run it, and it emulates x86 and DOS. And it has a, a stable system that allows us to uh, that allows us to write code. And many years into the future, as long as you have like a version of DOS running on in some kind of emulator, it will work. So it doesn't even have to be DOSBox. Uh, it could be QEMU or VirtualBox or anything like that. Those those virtual machines can actually emulate x86 processors, and you can install DOS on them, and uh, and then run all of your assembly code. So I think this actually works out very well, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try this out and see how it works for the assembly language series, and I'm going to be using DOSBox X. There's lots of there's actually several different versions or different forks of DOSBox, the original DOSBox, uh, which still exists. Um, but I'm going to use DOSBox X because uh, it has a graphical interface for controlling the uh, for controlling the uh, options, right? So normally you would have to go and find a text file and, and edit the text file. 
uh, DOSBox X gives you a nice little graphical interface to change the um, change the options. So I think that'll make it nice and easier for other people. Um, there's a bunch of uh, documentation for DOSBox, and you know some people can install you know Windows on it, you know Windows 98 or Windows 95, which is kind of cool. But we're just going to be using like the DOS part. Um, and I think that'll be great because that will allow us to explore sound and graphics and not have to worry about any of this changing on us. And even people in the future, 10, 20 years from now, will be able to go through this code and still be able to run it uh, if all goes well. So uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, you can see if you go, uh, and hopefully I will put all of this, uh, all of these links in the description below. So that way you'll be able to just click on them. But here is the front page of DOSBox X. They've got all these different versions. You can download version for whichever operating system and computer that you have. And um, and the only one I'll show uh, right now is actually this Linux version. So if you happen to be running Linux, if you click on this Flat Hub version, I would click on this, uh, this drop-down button. And then there's this Flatpak install uh, thing here, right? So I would uh, click that to copy that and then go into a terminal and run that. Now, of course, you have to have Flatpak installed, right? And uh, to check on that, you can say which Flatpak. And if you get Flatpak back, then you know that it's installed. If it's not installed, then you can do uh, sudo apt install Flatpak. And if you have a different package manager, you can do a different one, right? So if you have Pac-Man, then, then it would be, uh, well, depending on what kind of system you have, it's either like sudo pacman dash s flat pack or something like that. But you can go, you can always go ahead and uh, look that up on the internet on how to install that. But that's, that's how you'll install DOSBox. All the rest of the operating systems, you can install them uh, in the normal way that you would. So you, uh, so if you have, say, um, Windows, you can uh, download Windows for, you know, XPM Plus or Vista and Plus. And if you have, say, Windows 10 or maybe Windows 11, then you'll want the Vista Plus one, right? You'll download the Vista Plus and it will be a normal uh, setup executable, right? And you just run that executable. It'll put you through a wizard and you can install DOSBox. So um, I'm going to go through a little bit of this itself. So uh, the setup of the program. So I already showed you how to install it. And then after installation, there's a little bit of configuration that will make things a little bit better for you. And that's what I'm going to show. So I'm going to bring up DOSBox here. And, th and this will be kind of what you will see. You'll see something like this uh, when you open it up. And uh, if you click on this main menu and configuration tool, then you can, uh, it gives you this nice little GUI that allows you to control the configuration of your system. I'll show you some of the uh, settings that I made. So uh, I decided to set my window resolution to 1280 by 960. And the reason for that is the original resolution for DOS machines was 320 by uh, 2, 240, I believe. Or no. Yeah, 320 by 240 or something like that. Or 220. And so what I did is I multiplied that by, um, I believe I multiplied that by 3. Um, or actually, I multiplied it by a larger number. But basically, what I did is I kept that same 4 by 3 ratio. And so that way, I would have a 4 by 3, so it looks exactly like a regular DOS machine. And uh, the reason why I put 12... 80 by 960 is because my computer happens to be a 1440p or I happen to use a 1440p monitor and this allows me to have like a, a decent sized um, DOS box window right now uh, you can for the window position if you just put a comma in here it will actually automatically center uh, the DOS box window and then the only other thing that I like to use is there's a bunch of different options for the uh, output of the display, and I choose OpenGL NB, right? So uh, th that one I think works kind of the best for me, but you can try different versions. If you have Windows, uh, DDraw, which is DirectDraw, or Direct3D um, might work for you as well. Um, but uh, OpenGL NB uh, often is uh, one that works really well. 
uh, and then of course you can you can go down through here. Uh, I don't really uh, mess with anything else. And then uh, the only other thing you might want to look at is this render option. So I'll show this again. So this render uh, in the top uh, left hand right hand side. If you click render, um, I set the aspect ratio to true. And uh, oh, for any of these things, there's actually descriptions. If you click the help button, each option, uh, which is in red here, will have descriptions of the possible values that it can have. And you can read all of this information about uh, the different options and then pick which ones that you like. So I set my aspect ratio to true, um, or the aspect to true, I set the ratio to zero, zero, um, which means that it will maintain its um, four by three. Um, I set, I don't think I actually even set euro, I just let it to be its original value, but uh, euro, display the euro symbol instead of specified ASCII character, the default value is negative one, so I left that default. Um, the scaler I set to normal 2x, uh, and that seems to work decent enough for me. Uh, these GL shaders and pixel shaders, um, you can use them. Uh, really, the GL shader uh, is really the one that's that's uh, most useful. Uh, you can try out different ones. If you go on uh, DOSBox X, you can see what the different ones are. But we'll just leave these be. Um, this other, other things can be changed uh, as you get to working with Things, right, so it, it comes with a built-in sound blaster emulator and and the uh, and other types of uh, of things. Uh, so, but those are pretty good. The only other options that you'll really want to change is this autoexec.bat here down at the bottom. And so, if you click that, uh, you can type in different things here. And what I did is uh, uh, set a uh, amount point for my drive. Now when you first start up DOSBox, it'll probably ask you for a folder that you want to use as your main folder. And I would suggest that you create a folder ahead of time and, and use that as kind of the folder that you drop in all of your programs and everything else in. And so uh, the folder I use um, happens to be in my home directory. I put it under apps and then I have a directory for DOS and then I have this thing where I call the C drive. And the C drive is just a folder. and uh, uh, there's different commands that are available for, for DOSBox. And so I use this mount command. So it says mount on the C drive, uh, this folder. So that folder now becomes my C drive. And so then if I type C colon, uh, that will actually change my drive because the, the, the drive normally starts up as, uh, was it an F drive or something like that? And so I'm going to start in my C drive. So I put C, and then the other thing that I do is I set my path, and I set my path uh, uh, variable to folders that I want to reference programs in. And so the uh, programs that I will have, uh, obviously you want to keep the path that you currently have. So path equals uh, percent sign, path percent sign. And then you separate the different path variables with a semicolon. And so I, I like to have a folder in my C drive called apps. So if I create a binary, I'll put the binary in the apps folder. And then I have, uh, I've also installed phasm here, which I'll get into that a little bit later, but I installed phasm. So I have C apps phasm directory. And then I also have uh, C apps HXRT uh, bin directory. And I will talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then, of course, this last line here uh, references a binary that's in this HXRT bin directory, and it's HDPMI32EXE-R. Uh, uh, and what that does is it allows us um, to run 32-bit applications in DOSBox. So DOS uh, originally was a 16-bit operating system. And uh, that quickly, we, people quickly ran into like the limit of of uh, of sixteen bit applications, and um, and as thirty two bit processors were made, um, people created different ways of being able to write thirty two bit programs in DOS. And so this HDPMI thirty two exe actually allows us to have um, 
it allows us to use 32-bit applications and write 32-bit applications. So I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but I would encourage you to have something a lot like this in your um, in your autoexec.bat uh, file. And of course, you'll want to save all of these. I'm canceling out of them because I already have them set, but that's fine. Um, oh, and then the other thing that I would do um, at the very end is put CLS. And the reason for that is it will clear the screen. So that's what CLS stands for. And so if I save this and restart, what will happen is it starts me in my C drive, right? So instead of seeing the welcome page, I'm just at my C drive. And so that's kind of a nice thing to have. So the next thing that I want to talk about is installing software on here. So there's only a couple things that we need, and we saw that in our autoexec.bat. And one of those things is FASM. So uh, FASM is the flat assembler, which if you've seen my other two um, video series, I've used FASM uh, for assembly programming in both of those playlists. Um, so you can, there's actually a, a version of FASM for DOS and uh, you can find it here, flat assembler uh, 17332 for DOS. Um, and uh, if you download this, um, it'll download as a zip file and you can unzip that file and it will become a folder. And then I, what I would do is I would rename that folder to FASM and then copy that folder into your uh, C drive folder or whatever you called your folder that you're using for uh, your C drive. And so that's exactly what I did. I'll show you uh, for files. I'll show you apps, DOS, uh, C drive. Uh, so you can see I've got apps dev. And so if I go into apps, you can see I have a FASM directory. And so this is the unzipped FASM directory. I just renamed the FASM directory. Instead of it being a long name, it's just FASM. And then these are all the files that are inside of it. And so that's all this is. This is my C drive. I've got a couple different things in here. I've got some games. I've got all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and then uh, this is my apps directory. In fact, uh, probably what I'll do here is rename this. Uh, instead of dev, I'm going to call it code. There we go. So that's good. And then uh, what we'll do is I'll exit out of this. Uh, the other thing that we'll need is um, that um, uh, DMPI, right? So it's called a, like a DOS extender, and that allows us to, to run 32-bit applications in DOS. And so there's a couple different places you can get these things. Um, uh, one of them here is this HX DOS extender, and I'm going to put all this in the description. And this is at uh, jfeth.de uh, slash hx uh, .html. And uh, he has a, a bunch of uh, interesting information here for this DOS extender, the history, and how it works. Um, but really, all you need is this DPMI32 um, exe. And so if you scroll down, he shows like, oh, hey, I've got like OpenGL and all this other stuff, and it works for all kinds of computers. But then at the very bottom uh, are the releases that he's got for it. And so he's got this one, this 216 stable, um, and this release candidate, uh, 217. And that one is password protected because on some Windows antivirus programs, they don't like the, the DLL, one of the DLLs that's in there. Um, so I would recommend getting like the 217 version um, uh, and get the runtime, right? The X at, uh, X H X R T runtime. That's really what you need. Um, and that'll work. Now there is another place that you can go. There's actually a bunch of these extenders all over the internet, but, um, there's another one here. Um, uh, there's a GitHub and this one is a little bit newer. Um, or it's being kept up. I'm not sure what all other changes they really need to make because DOS hasn't changed. But uh, this um, this GitHub repository has them. And if you go to the releases, um, they talk about all the different ones here. Um, and what you really want is the HXRT. Um, and of course, he's releasing version 2.20. So it's HXRT220.zip. That's the one that you want. And so you'll download that, you'll unzip it. Uh, no matter which uh, place you get it from, you download and unzip it. And of course, let's see, so let's go to the files. 
um, apps, uh, DOS, uh, C drive. Let's go to apps and I copy it to my apps directory. So I called it HXRT and um, so, or renamed it to that uh, if it was longer and then it had all of this stuff in there. Um, now mine is from the Japheth site, um, but yours will probably be the same if it's from the other site. And uh, the imp most important part is like this bin directory. And the thing that you'll be using is this, uh, where's the DPMI? I, th I believe it's HDPMI32 uh, uh, EXE. And so that's kind of the most important part, but just have it in your uh, apps directory. Um, and then what you can do is when you have it in your apps directory, you can go to DOSBox and you can go to the configuration tool and autoexec.bat and you can make sure that you have just this path in there, right? Apps, HXRT, and bin. And so that way you can just reference hdpmi32.exe. And this little dash R here, that stands for resident. Uh, so what, what happens in DOS is normally one program has complete control of the computer. And there's only one program that can be allowed and in uh, loaded into RAM at one time. What R dash R does is it allows a program to stay resident, which means it, it gets loaded into memory and it stays in memory. So then you can load other programs too. And that's uh, the reason why that's important for this is that HDPMI 32 um, has all of the, the code to be able to allow 32-bit programs to run. And so you want that to still be in memory all the time. You don't want it to disappear. So that's that's why we have the dash R. So basically set, set your uh, environment like this, and that should be good. Um, now, what's really cool about um, the... Um, What's very cool about uh, the assembler, like the Phasm assembler, is uh, I believe it's Phasm D. Uh, is the um, it actually has an IDE that's built for DOS, which is really cool. So if I go back out here and say go to code. I've got some uh, code here, but if I say uh, phasm D, it'll open up the assembler IDE, which is pretty neat. Um, and there's there's actually a bunch of different um, keyboard commands, and I don't exactly remember them right now, but there's actually a readme that tells you all of the keyboard commands that exist for this, that allow you to compile and run and all these things from the IDE, which is great. And so if you hit escape, uh, you can escape out of the IDE. And so that's what I imagine I will use for creating our assembly programs in DOS. We'll have a nice text editor um, that allows us to uh, write our programs. And so that's pretty good. So the next thing that you'll want to do if you're following along is you'll now have um, apps, code, and uh, well, I mean, you don't need games or anything like that, but you'll probably want to have apps and code. So if you go into apps, right, and uh, dir is show the directory, um, you'll see we've got uh, a bunch of different apps here. I, I have a bunch of different apps, but you should have phasm and you should have hxrt. So if you go into phasm, uh, you'll see a bunch of different things here. And one you'll see is an examples directory. So if you go into examples, uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of different examples here, right? So what we'll do is we're going to pick one. We're going to say exe demo. Uh, we'll see what this one looks like. And uh, this one already is uh, compiled, but if you want to compile it, you can just go phasm exe demo uh, dot asm, right? And if we run this, it should run the Phasm compiler just like it would on Linux or, or Mac or any other place. And so it says how many passes it, it, it went through, how many bytes it used. Uh, so then if we look, we've got exe demo.exe. So if I do exe demo, um, and in DOS, you can just type the name and hit enter, and it will assume you want the exe. Um, so that's the Hello World program. So that's pretty nice. So if I do Phasm D, and say exe demo dot asm, 
I can open up that file and this shows the file and it's, this is great. So we've got, um, we've got syntax highlighting and everything and we've got a full program that's showing us hello world. Uh, we can go out and try another example program. Let's try the Mandel program, which should be a, um, uh, I think it's a Mandelbrot set. So um, this one happens to be a com file. So if we do, um, uh, let's take a look at it. Phasmd Mandel.asm. And you'll see that this, uh, this program is a little bit bigger. Uh, and you see that it's actually using graphics. We have a VGA palette, um, and we're doing iterations, um, and this is great. So let's compile this. Let's do phasmmandel.asm, and it runs in a couple passes. It only took 0.1 seconds. And if we do mandel, uh, it will run this code that creates the Mandelbrot set, a uh, visualization of the Mandelbrot set. So that's pretty cool. So now we know that it works. So if all of this works for you, then you've properly set up your uh, programs. If it doesn't work, the most likely thing um, uh, that's wrong is if, if trying to run, say, phasmd doesn't work, it'll give you an error, right? And it'll say, you know, there's, it can't, it's missing like an extender or something. And that means that you probably need to set uh, this autoexec.bat. You need to have your HXRT thing, and you need to have the path set, right? Your computer needs to be able to find where the HXRT bin folder is uh, so it can look at this HDPMI32. Um, so these things are necessary, right? Uh, so that's, that's about all I have to say for that. I've probably talked um, uh, for a long time now. But now your environment should be set up. You should be able to run programs. And the next time I create a, an assembly language video, uh, we'll be writing some assembly ourselves. So that's great. And uh, till next time.